This video is sponsored by Squarespace. In the beginning, there was no soup, no stew, no braising, no blanching, no poaching, no frying even. When the human ancestor Homo erectus first started cooking their food, somewhere in the hundreds of thousands of years ago, it was almost certainly by just jamming it straight into the fire at the end of a stick. Roasting is where cooking all began, dry heating methods. And then somewhere in the tens of thousands of years ago came the epiphany. <laughs> Stone soup? Nah, it's called a pot boiler. Hot rocks dropped into some kind of water-safe containment. This is at least one of the ways that people simmered food for many thousands of years, until they got cooking vessels that were both water and fire safe. We're going to recreate both of these cooking inventions in here. And to be clear, nobody really knows how the first soup or stew was cooked. The methods used for that kind of cooking rot really quickly, and therefore they don't leave much archaeological record. So a lot of this is speculation on the part of scholars who have thought about this for a long time. In 2015, the anthropologist John Speth shook up the thinking on this topic quite a lot. He argued that stew or soup or such might be much older than previously thought. He simply observed, empirically, that you can take a flammable material, like an animal hide, you can fill it with wet stuff to cook, hold it directly over a fire, and it won't burn. The water that it's soaked in won't let it burn, even if it's flammable. Certainly my little bit of animal hide was in no danger of burning, in part because the water that it was soaked in dropped down onto the fire beneath it and put the fire out. But maybe ancient people could have figured out a way to do this with something more waterproof and less drippy. Maybe an animal stomach, maybe a woven basket lined with clay, something like that. There is archaeological evidence that Neanderthals ate wet cooked food. This is a grain of barley recovered from the back teeth of a Neanderthal in modern-day Iraq, and the scientists here conclude it appears to have been boiled. The person who ate this lived maybe 50,000 years ago, which is well before we have the first archaeological indication of anyone doing this arguably more advanced method of wet cooking. I just dug a little hole in the dirt, then I lined it with a really big leaf, a banana leaf from my Indian grocery, drop some water into that and check it out. That's holding water, no leaking at all. Now over here, my little fire, I'm going to drop some stones. Smooth river cobbles were historically a popular choice for this, less likely to chip off little shards into your food. Then you just drop in some grains or whatever food you're trying to boil, grab a couple of sticks and very carefully lift a hot stone into your little basin. Not exactly a rolling boil. We're going to need some more stones. And I suppose it'd be helpful to have a second person who could get down and blow the ash off the rock before you drop it in. But hey, there's some actual boiling there. When stones are repeatedly heated up and then rapidly cooled down like that, they gradually start to exhibit a characteristic pattern of cracking and glazing that is known as, wait for it, crazing. That's actually where we get the words crazy and crazed. He's all cracked up. Crazed river cobbles first enter the archaeological record about 30,000 years ago, the Upper Paleolithic period. Nobody knows for sure if those stones were used as pot boilers. They may have simply been used as hearth stones, but at some point, pot boilers definitely became a thing. This is a method of cooking that persisted well into the era of written history. Some people still do it today. And I can tell you from experience that it works surprisingly well. Your water is safely away from your fire, so there's no risk of putting your fire out. And with just a hole in a leaf, I was able to get perfectly soft-cooked grains in about an hour. Might seem like a lot of work, but compared to what? I didn't have to grind those grains down into flour using primitive stone tools and then bake them into bread. And any sand or little pebbles or anything mixed in with my grain as a result of, you know, really kind of primitive processing methods, well, it just sinks to the bottom of the water and you just don't have to reach in there and eat it. You just eat what floats to the top. I kind of feel like I'm going to get cancer from eating all that ash, but hey, you only need to live like 14 years in order to reproduce successfully. 
purposefully, so it's all good. But seriously, wet cooking was such an advance for humanity. You're able to extract so much more nutrients from the food, because nothing is dripping onto the fire and being wasted. It's all preserved in that broth that you can drink, and you can soften really, really tough foods down into a form that you can chew and digest. You can simply feed more people with soup. Soup is good food. And here's another benefit of stone boiling. Scientists believe this may be the way that ancient Americans invented nixtamalization, the process by which you soak corn in an alkaline solution to remove that waxy hull around the corn and to make hominy grits and tortillas and such. Nixtamalization also renders certain amino acids in the corn more bioavailable to us. If your diet is based almost solely on corn and you don't nixtamalize it, you eventually get this terrible nutritional deficiency disease called pellagra. So nixtamalization is really important, but I've always wondered, how did people first get the idea to treat their food in a caustic alkali? Turns out it might have happened accidentally when they boiled their corn with limestone pot boilers. In 2011, these scientists went to Utah and did an experiment where they boiled corn using the same cedar mesa limestone that ancient people there would have used. And the resulting boil water was a strong enough base to nixtamalize the corn. Their experiment doesn't prove it happened that way, but it does prove it could have happened that way. That said, stone boiling in a leaf or an animal skin or something has its obvious disadvantages. There's a reason that we all cook in pots today. Much easier to just throw a pot directly onto the fire. So let's try to recreate the first cooking pot. I've been digging the first level of this terraced vegetable garden into the hill behind my new house. And when I got through a few inches of turf and topsoil, I hit red clay. Hardly surprising, this hill, like most of the land around Knoxville, eventually slopes down to the Tennessee River. And clay is super common in river basins. One of the ways clays form is through the chemical weathering of exposed rock. Rain is slightly acidic because of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Carbonic acid in the rainwater lands on the rocks and it dissolves them a little bit. All those dissolved minerals flow down into river and lake basins, and they flow into deposits that today we call clay. Technically, this might not be clay. It's probably loam clay mixed with silt and sand, which are little bits of minerals with significantly larger grain sizes. If I wanted to make really nice clay, I would dig up that loam, fully dissolve it in lots of water, and then filter out all of the sand and silt grains that are too big to qualify as true clay, but I wanted to do it the way like the first person did it. You got to figure that first person was just digging a hole for some other reason, maybe to line with leaves and drop in hot rocks. Maybe I should get in there. Are you Mario in the pipe? Yes. And then if we just keep ourselves in the mindset of this first person, we notice that that clay-rich dirt down there is smooth and plastic. It's moldable. And the wetter pieces are more moldable. So you figure, ah, if I add water to this, I can start molding it into something. You really have to bash it and work it to get the water distributed through. Modern potters call this wedging the clay, and it has many benefits, including working out air bubbles that might cause the piece to crack later. You can also get out any big rocks and such that you come across as you work the water in. Once the clay is wedged, it's smooth and plastic, you just play with it and you figure, hey, I could use a thing for holding other things, and there you go. That was way easier than carving a bowl out of rock or even wood. You let it dry in the sun for a day, and it's nice and hard now, but hmm, how do I get it off the rock that it's sitting on? A modern potter might use a length of metal wire. You just kind of shimmy it underneath the bottom of the piece to kind of cut it off of the surface that it's stuck to. But the first person doing this didn't have metal wire, so let's think of something else. Let's just bash that up and start from scratch. What we have at this stage is basically mud brick, which is a surprisingly strong material. It was a lot of work for me to get that dissolved into workable clay again. The thing that eventually worked was bashing it with a rock. You can see why people were able to get so far in life only using stone tools. You might say they were living in a whole age of stone. 
and I'll trademark that later. Anyway, there's my second draft pot, and this time let's dry it on some leaves. Yeah, that'll keep it from sticking to anything. And after like a week of drying, this is rock hard. I'm quite sure that somebody then tried to cook in this, and it might have worked. The problem is even very dry clay will dissolve in water. So you would get kind of a muddy broth, and then eventually the clay, the pot, would just kind of melt away. Unless you got it so hot in your cooking fire that you fired it. That's what potters do, right? They fire their clay in a kiln. Extreme high heat changes the chemical structure of the clay into an actual ceramic that is hard and won't dissolve in water. It seems kind of likely to me that people maybe first did that accidentally by using a fire to accelerate the drying of the piece, that maybe is what they were thinking they were doing. Or maybe they actually tried to cook in the dried piece, the water boiled out, the piece stayed in the fire, and it got hot enough to actually fire, turn into a ceramic. To more reliably fire our pots, we're going to need the first kiln, which would have been a pit. How convenient. We already have a pit where we just dug out our clay. Get a fire going in the pit, and then in goes the dried pot, which I have preheated by letting it sit by the fire. If it heats up too fast, it'll surely crack. Then you just keep feeding that fire, letting glowing hot coals crumple down onto the pot, eventually fully encasing it. It is insane, the heat coming off of that hole, even with no air to feed the fire from below. Then you just leave it, walk away, and here we are about 24 hours later, and the coals are still very hot, and the pot is way too hot to touch. Two days later, and out it comes, and yep, there's a big old crack up one side. Pottery is hard, but if we just use the other side, we should be able to boil some food. And this time we can boil it directly on the fire instead of shuttling around hot rocks. Scientists used to think pottery like this was first invented five or 10,000 years ago, and maybe it was in much of the world. But in 2012, scientists announced they had found pottery fragments in a cave in China from 20,000 years ago, by far the oldest find of any real ceramic. They don't know for sure if these were cooking pots, but they did seem to have been used in a fire. Clay pots would have been people's main type of cooking for a long time, well past the Stone Age, into the Bronze and Iron Ages, and into the early modern period. No doubt, metal is better. It is much more thermally conductive, and you don't have to worry as much about it cracking from thermal stress. But until relatively recently, metal was extremely expensive, far too expensive for a normal family's cooking pot. This ceramic pot was as simple, effective, ubiquitous solution to meet a universal need. Much like Squarespace. Clay is all around you and Squarespace is all around you. There's a reason that so many people who need a website of some kind choose to build and run it with Squarespace. It's as easy as digging six inches in your backyard. You pick a template suited to your purpose, you throw in your own photos and your text, and then you just drop in whatever additional features you need, like Talk. Check this out. Talk is the new all-in-one reservation system from Squarespace. It's for restaurant and hospitality type businesses. Anybody who needs to take reservations or sell tickets online, the pricing for you is flat, so you're not penalized for getting lots of business. You own the data that you get on your customers who use it. It's really worth checking out. Starting a Squarespace site is always free, but when you're ready to pay to take it live or some such, use my code REGUSIA at checkout, and you're going to save 10%. Thank you, Squarespace. And thank you, Pottery. You were great for many thousands of years. That said, I'm totally going inside and using my stainless steel pan now.